Good afternoon and welcome to the last event in the Bell Hooks Spring Residency. My name is Stephanie Browner. I'm the Dean of Eugene Lane College, the Liberal Arts College within the New School. And I'm glad you've come out today for a great conversation with three brilliant women. Brief introductions. There's so much to say about each one, but I will just give you a taste of what they have done and been thinking about and doing in the world. Kim Sykes is an actress and writer in New York City. As a writer, she's had several short stories published by Akashic Books, and most recently had a story included in the best African American fiction. As an actress, you can see her in the independent film Pariah, which won the John Cassavetes Award of the 2012 Independent Spirit Awards. Formerly, she was the director of special projects at the Coalition Against Trafficking in Women. She combines her acting and writing work with human rights issues and progressive politics. Lisa Fisher is a singer. She has toured and tours currently with the Rolling Stones, Sting, and Nine Inch Nails. She has made music and sung backup and toured with Tina Turner, Chaka Khan, Beyonce, Dionne Warwick, Dolly Parton, Bobby McFerrin, Alicia Keys, Lou Reed, Louis Vega, Aretha Franklin, John Schofield, George Benson, and I better stop. <laughs> Along with many other top session backup singers such as Darlene Love, Mary Clayton, Patty Austin, and Judith Hill, she was featured in Morgan Neville's acclaimed and award winning, Oscar award winning documentary, 20 Feet from Stardom. She's won a Grammy for her best female R&B performance for her hit single, How Can I Ease the Pain? Bell Hooks. Bell Hooks has written over 30 books taught all around the country, inspires us to love and to decolonize our minds and to think critically and generously about how to change the world, decenter our own lives and the whiteness and oppression and patriarchy all around us. And she has generously given to the new school, both in a residency last fall, where she inspired in a number of conversations to packed audiences how to think well and generously. And she has done so this spring again. And then again, Belle will be here in the fall for a week-long residency with many great conversations. So welcome. Thank you for coming. wowed by this building. It's so neat. It's my first time in it. We are happy to be here. Lorraine Hansberry has been kind of the garden angel of these conversations. Um, I was thinking about how she raised so many questions for me um, growing up about the black female body and the, an exuberance for life. And so I was trying to find my quote, but the way life is, you can never find your quote when you want it. Um, but anyway, it's the quote where she's saying that she, wish, she wishes to live. Um, she re may recall that she died of cancer at 34. And um, I'm so struck by her own revolutionary fervor and her zest for life. Uh, if you don't know who she is, she did the play Raisin in the Sun um, that is happening right now. Um, we are sort of closing out the week of conversations about the black female body, talking about power and the power of our voice. And I couldn't think of anybody more currently embodying the power of the voice than Lisa Fisher, whom we have all, yes, clap for that. Yes. We have been talking a lot in the past few days about the damaged images of black women, the brokenheartedness, starting with our discussion about black girls. And the thing that we wanted to end with is, is images of black women, the three of us, who have claimed their own space, their own power, um, their own joy. Uh, and just to talk about that as the power of voice and the power of our choices. Because we've been talking a lot about the many myriad ways we are acted upon in, dare I say it, imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy, <laughs> where we don't have, um, 
where, where so often people feel they don't have the control that they want to have. So that I want to bring also into this discussion the Carrie Mae Weems exhibit that's happening at the Guggenheim and urge all of you to, if you have a chance, to go and see it. Because as we talk about decolonized images of blackness, we've been talking about who is the audience for such images. And Carrie's work um, from the very beginning has been work um, as a photographer that has brought us different types of images of the black female body, humanizing images, the incredible image of herself in the series Roaming, which is on the cover of the book for the show, um, to me just pops right out as a different kind of image of black, the black female body. And throughout, Carrie, not unlike Frida Kahlo, has used her own image, her body, in the making of her art. So please see the show. Uh, familiarize yourself with her work. Um, and just, again, thinking about, I mean, Carrie said at one point about the woman on the cover, which is a shot of her self, this woman can stand in for me and for you. She leads you into history. She's a witness and a guide. One of the things that Carrie said um, that's in the book as well is that when she first began to see images of black women represented, she said, I was shocked. I mean, the images of black women were just downright strange. In some cases, the images were so monstrously ugly, they scared me. Indeed, if I were as ugly as American culture has made me out to be, I'd hide my head like an ostrich in the sand. So that, in a sense, it's from that sort of hegemonic construction of a distorted image of black female body that Carrie begins to construct for us a photographic history, um, a genealogy, one might say, of black female beauty. And it's all types of black female bodies, from girlhood um, to our elders. So, so again, that's part of, hopefully, a transformation that we will see in the years to come, a long overdue transformation in how we see the black female body. I, I thought we might start with Lisa talking some about her own evolution in body image, body idea. Hi, y'all. <laughs> um, as you were speaking, I was thinking to myself, I had these images of being aware of myself. It's like, as a child, I didn't really see myself. I saw everything outside myself, and even what I saw was blurred because my vision was really bad. So everything was always filtered to me. Everything seemed soft and, and uh, just unclear. And so when I would see my mother doing her makeup in the bathroom, which would be something simple as just putting on some lipstick and some eyeliner and maybe using the lipstick for blush. Or she would be curling her hair in preparation for my father coming home from work. It was an act of love to me to watch her prepare herself for him. And she seemed to enjoy it. It seemed like it was a, a zen part of her day. You know, so that, being able to see myself in her was an interesting thing for me as I got to be older. I, let, I lost my mom when she was um, 35. I was 17. And so I didn't get a chance to really have that beauty bonding, go shop, you know what I mean? Yeah, go out yeah. and shop and, yeah. and um, be a woman at the same time your mom was a woman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like it was always this, um, especially towards like 15, 16, and 17, like that angst of, you know, I know, Mom, you want me to be a particular way, but I'm just, I'm stretching out. I'm trying to find myself. And she's just like, mm, you know. And, uh, and so I'd be looking at magazines, and I'd look at, you know, Cosmopolitan and whatever was available. 
and I would see a world that didn't feel inclusive of me. I felt that I had to aspire to be whatever I was seeing on television and in magazines. And um, luckily, I was at a point where I felt not aware of myself. I didn't care about weight. Weight was never an issue in my house. Everybody just ate and, you know, we were moving and, and constantly going. And so there wasn't a weight issue. But after my mother passed away, I started to gain some weight. And I didn't even know it. My aunt actually told me that I was gaining weight. I had no clue. I thought it was, you know, cute that, you know, my clothes were fitting tighter, you know. <laughs> and so when she told me I was gaining weight, I was like, oh, that's so good, you know. And she kind of looked at me like I'd lost my mind. And uh, I think at that point, I started to see myself through other people's reactions. And then I think about work and just being on stage and just, um, my first gig was with uh, the Crystals. And it was the first time I had to fit into the image of someone else's expectations. You know, it's like, here's the job and here's your uniform. And at that point, I was picking up a bit of weight. So, you know, I'd have to fit into these outfits. And uh, I couldn't help but look at myself in the mirror with the other young ladies. And I'd go, something's not fitting here. So I don't feel like I fit in. and. I think at that point, I started to hate myself for it. And, uh, and so then began the, like, what diet should I be on? You know, it's like all of a sudden, people would be looking at what I'm eating and, girl, you gonna eat all that? I'm like, mm, I've been eating all that for a million years or whatever, and it's never affected me. But I think for some reason, emotionally, my emotions were, I like to think that my emotions were making me hold on to the weight in a different way. It wasn't burning the same way because of the way that I felt about myself. And eventually, just working for different groups and, you know, like my experience with Luther Vandross, which is one of my dearest memories of just becoming a woman. Um, I had never had my makeup done before, and you know, Luther had this amazing makeup artist, and I had the you know makeup done, and I didn't look in the mirror. I'm getting the makeup done, I'm like, oh, this is so nice. Someone's doing putting stuff on my face, and close your eyes, you put the lashes on, and blah blah blah, and, and then I turn around, I look in the mirror, I'm like, who is that? I didn't know who that was, but I knew that whoever that was was the vision that Luther wanted to present because he felt that he wanted to give his audience the best of what he knew, you know? And so for 25 years, you know, going through the transformation and the playtime and the, it was interesting because I felt like when I wasn't working, I wouldn't wear a stitch of makeup because it was just alien to me. It's like when I look in the mirror, I want to see my skin glowing, and I want to see what my brows naturally look like, and I want to see what my lips really look like, and I want to see that thing that I love to see in other people. It's like you see women walking down the street, and their skin and their energy is just, they're glowing, and I wanted to keep that. But work was a different situation. It was like, okay, this is the uniform, and this is the image. and. Um, I didn't have a problem with that. I mean, I loved the playtime. I loved all the, the hair weaving and the blah, 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 that was drudgery as far as like, you know, you sit for four days and you're getting your hair braided and getting your hair done and, you know, your butt's hurting and your back is killing you and you're like, you know. So all that kind of drama was not fun, but, you know, it just kind of made me feel like this is the job, this is the excellence that, that he wanted to give to the audience, and so this is what it takes. It's no different than the hard work that we would have to do to prepare 
the music or the dance steps or, or any of that sort of thing. At one point, I started to be so frustrated with myself because Luther's eye was so, um, it was like an arrow. Oh. And uh, if there was a bead missing from a dress, he would notice it. Oh. And knowing his eye, and this is me, this is something I... Can you hear? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. This is something I chose to do to myself. But I ended up having major eating disorders, major issues with just trying to fit into the clothes that this man spent his hard-earned money on. You know, some of the dresses would be $10,000 a dress back then. You know. This was the 90s, right? Yeah, The 80s. 90s were like the decade from hell mm -hmm. <laughs> for women. It really was. Mm -hmm. It was just like the terrible, terrible. We were starving ourselves and going to the gym and hurting our backs and mm -hmm. sitting for four hours with the weave. And, you know, I mean, it was just a nasty, nasty, <laughs> nasty decade. Thank God it's over. Who was born in the 90s here? There's a few left. You're lucky you Yay. missed it. I mean, you, you were born, but by the time you became a woman or a girl, then you were past the insanity of the 90s, which was just crazy time. Mm -hmm. So you were beginning to question and interrogate this for yourself. Yeah, I started turning in the world that was presented to me in on myself, trying to fit into it. Oh. and and keep a job, you know? Because at that point, it wasn't about what, well, it's not actually true. What you sound like is extremely important. But if you have more than that in the eyes of whoever is hiring you, then that was considered a good thing and you could eat that week, you know? So, you know, and just the competition uh, with singers and just, yeah, a lot of it was just really, um, you, would, you would hurt yourself trying to keep a job, you know. And so now at this point, you know, after all the years of all that drama, and I'm at, I'm 55 you now, and, um, you know, I'm when watching. When did that stop for you? When did you begin to say, you know, I just want to be Lisa? Honestly, I think recently, to be honest, I guess in the last four years, five years, I had a dear friend that I grew up with uh, in elementary school. I, I tease because I said she knew me before I had tits. <laughs> she, um, she was a special soul. She, um, she could look at a situation and just see it for what it was. She, couldn't, she wouldn't judge people. She would watch the news. She would cry watching the news. Mm -hmm. She would cry three hours later thinking about the news that she just saw. You know, she was just really um, sensitive. And living in Brooklyn where I was at, that wasn't, being sensitive wasn't a great thing, you know. And so we became really close friends. And uh, two years ago, she passed away from uh, cancer. And um, it was during this time that I started noticing a change in me. I just did not give a shit. <laughs> I didn't give a shit. I just realized that people are on this earth and they're trying to live. And I'm worried about what? I'm worried about, oh gee, did I get the right texture hair from Lugos this week? Did I, you know, did I get the right shade of lipstick from Yves Saint Laurent? To, you know, just all these things that I was just starting to get very anal about. Um, it just paled in comparison to real life. And I think not having a family, you know, not married, no children, that kind of thing, it's just my work became uh, my life. It's my everything but just some of the aspects of it was not in balance. And um, it was during that time that I just really started gaining weight and just 
out of stress and um, trying my best to um, spend as much time with her as far as what the things we would like to eat, the food that we shared, um, and just everything that surrounded joy and not worrying about anything. Or even if we decided, well, you know, we're going to do the Gerson therapy, and you know, we're going to, I'm getting a Norwalk juicer, and we're going to press your juices, and we're going to do all this stuff. And even if it was something healthy, it was still something that I wanted to share with her. And, it, and looking at the music and just all the other stuff that I worried about just didn't really matter as much. And then after she passed away, I kind of looked at myself in the mirror. Whew. And I could see myself, could really see myself. And though it was not in balance with my past, as far as the vision of what people were accustomed to seeing in me, I felt for the first time in a long time, I liked what I saw. And that was so odd for me. I would walk down the street and people would go, um, you know, you remind me of this singer, Lisa Fisher. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I would, I would kind of laugh or I'd go into a, you know, into a department store and I'd give my credit card and, and they'd look, oh, wow, well, you have the same name as that singer, you know? And I'd go, yeah. And I'll just keep it moving. <laughs> because this, the, the, the energy, thank you, the energy of shock that you get that you're not the person on the album cover. You're not the chick in the video with the hair flowing. You're not the chick that you were 10 years ago. There's something beautiful about having a photograph and then looking back in time and saying, that's a beautiful moment. But I think it's really difficult for people to let go of these moments yeah. so that they can include new ones and beautiful ones and growing ones and changing ones and wise ones and stupid ones. And you know, it's, it's, you want to have a collection of photographs in your life. And um, I just got to the point where I can actually look in the mirror and go, you know what, I'm not a size eight and it's okay. It's okay. And that's the kind of I, comfort when I saw 20 Feet from Stardom, I looked at all those other women who were still trying to make it on the terms of imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchal culture. You know, the I want a t-shirt that says that, though. <laughs> Don't you want a t-shirt that says that? I so want a t-shirt that says imperial But Castor. the print will be so small, we, we won't be able to read it. But, but we would all know what it said. <laughs> but it's, 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 I mean, when I, what fascinated me about Lisa when I was seeing the film was that I felt that the other women were still within the boundaries of a certain kind of framed notion of femininity and beauty. And there was Lisa breaking out of that boundary, but she seemed to have such a sense of self-fulfillment and self-satisfaction. And that, that's what I wanted us to be able to talk about. And because it is getting to that, that we find that space where we can have optimal well-being and power. The true power, uh, it doesn't matter what you know. What matters is who you are. And it's getting to that place where you can really be comfortable with who you are, when you can have an acceptance. And I want Kim to jump in here and talk, because Kim also has had a long regime as an actress of having to be a certain way, of having to look a certain way, of having to be on constantly on your body. You're both in your body, and you're the constant surveiller of your body. Well, that was the horrible 90s that I was talking about. You know, that, that thing that said, and you know, coming of age, or actually I was a little older than still, I wasn't coming of age, I was already of age, in the 90s, you know. Um, 
it was the, as they said, the me decade. It really was about making sure you were in shape, making sure you were a certain size, you were always wearing makeup, you were there and done. Uh, that was for all women. Um, and I have to tell you, when, when the time came, when I reached that I don't give a shit moment, uh, that every woman reaches, you, you, trust me, young girls, you're gonna love that moment. It's not an easy moment to get to because you have one foot in the old world and you're trying to get into the new world. And so all your friends in the old world are going, what the hell, what are you doing? Why are you changing? And then the new foot's going, I have to change because the world's changing and I wanna change and I'm tired of this, you know? Uh, but boy, when you cross over, it's just such a relief. You know, to, to walk down the street. I remember the first weeks of walking down the street with no makeup not trying to smile, just going to the store to get something and coming back. I think Facebook lit up for like two days. Did you see Kim? Oh my God. My friends were calling me going, girl, they talk about you. And it's just like, I'm just walking down the street because I don't feel like doing stuff today or being Kim today. Can I just be me? Mm. But that's every woman. I think there's every woman's going to reach that moment where you say, I don't give a shit. And you're just going to walk out the I don't house. believe that. You don't? No. No, I, I mean, I think there are, that's true. We talked about this earlier. There are women who fight that, but those are the ones that you see and they're 45 and still trying to wear the miniskirt and the wigs and shaking it. I mean, we talk about that. That's kind of painful to watch. But that's why I think, like, for you, for Lisa, that when you're in a certain kind of profession that offers you, this is what it takes to succeed. And then you decide, I'm not going to deal on that ground anymore. I'm not going to deal on that territory anymore. But again, that's, that to me, that was, it wasn't succeeding. The 90s was, this is what it takes to be famous. There was no All succeed. Right. All right. It was about being famous, right? Everybody thought they were going to be famous. And so, um, you know, you, and I'm sure, I don't know about you, girlfriend, but I thought I was going to be famous there for a while. I really thought I was full of myself, you know. And then you get to a point you think everybody can't be famous. There's not enough jobs. And certainly as a black girl, you know, get in the back of the line, girlfriend. There's Halle Berry and all these other people in front of you. So, you know. And then you're older then. So it's, you know, there's all these obstacles, but when you're young, you don't think about that. You think, well, that's them, but that's not me, because I'm going to be famous. I'm telling you, I'm going to be famous. Did Le Lisa, did you have that it's in your younger years? I... I tell the truth now, girlfriend. Yeah, no, I am. It's interesting. <laughs> I, I, I liked... What I wanted for myself was that financial independence. Well, that's for sure. That's what I wanted. That was a I wanted thing. to be able to go out on a date yes. with a guy and go, I'm paying for dinner. You know? Well, I never and wanted to pay, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with that's, you on, I'm with you on that, Kim. I mean, it's a terrible joke. So. <laughs> it's OK. It's OK. But I wanted to feel, for some reason, it made me feel like I had more control yeah, in absolutely. my life, you know? Yeah. To say, no one's buying me anything. I'm not beholding to anybody. And if they want to be around me, it's because they want to be around me. Yeah, financial know? independence is huge. Yeah. But and fame and money kind of go together. This is true. I, I, I'm, no, I'm, I'm in our business, in, in, it, in acting and singing, kind of, maybe. Well, not, I don't know. I shouldn't talk for you, sweetie. I'm no, sorry. no, it's beautiful. No, this is good. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm a bit of a... <laughs> Um, it was the, the fame part that frustrated me. It was the way that people would change. It's like when I had, um, when How Can I Use a Pain came out, I heard from people I didn't even know I knew. You know? They're like, don't you remember me from so and so and such and such? And I'm going, wow, I'm getting old, or they're lying. I'm not quite sure which of the two it is. It's just you would get all this attention that you wouldn't get. It didn't feel sincere. A lot of it wasn't sincere. It was kind of like, it's the I know so-and-so thing. And, and I, uh, it's not my favorite. It's not my favorite. So the, the fame part of it wasn't, anything I was looking for. It was always just feeling like every human being has a gift, and no gift is less important than another person's gift. How each individual looks at something 
will change according to what's important to them. But in the real world of things, it's like I just, I always felt like everyone is important. Everyone is valid. Everyone, I don't care what you do. I mean, I went to Japan and I, and I saw this woman behind the counter at McDonald's and the pride, the way she stood, the way she looked, the way she engaged with something as simple as just what do you wish to eat was just so full of her spirit and her self-worth that I was just like, I, I, I want more of that. I want to see more of that in people, no matter what you do, you know. So you cultivated that in yourself, because that's what comes yeah. across uh, to me in the film. Did, did you all feel that way too, that that's what came across, this sense that, you know, I have made my choices, I'm accountable to them, and I'm living my life? Yeah. It's, you know, it's funny sometimes. But somebody told me, well, you know Lisa wanted fame, so we're not clear on the fame thing. So you never wanted the fame trip. I'm good without it. I'm so good without it. Because I, I like being able to, to go down the street and go to the supermarket. Like today, I was just like, I didn't have anything in the fridge. I just got back from LA. And I'm like, do I go to Hoboken where people will actually know me now because of the film war? Do I go around the corner in Union City where nobody really cares? I'm going to Union City. Do you know what I mean? I just wanna, I just wanna get a watermelon. I'm good. You know, I just, I want to get what I need to get and everything is cool. And people were nice to me because they were nice human beings. You know, it was just refreshing, you know. And not that everyone that, that speaks to you because of what you do isn't nice, but it's a mixed bag and you never know what you're going to get till it's too late, you know. So how have the, the other people, though, the men you work with and for sometimes, how did they take your, your whole look changing? That you weren't gonna have the long straight hair, you weren't gonna have the size five body. Luther didn't live long enough to see that transformation really. I think he did get to see the short hair and the how can I use the paint stuff, but it was still a wig, you know. Um, and I was starting to get a little bit bigger there, but he understood, you know. It was a part of his battle as well, you know. So I think he knew how sensitive I was and probably knew that I would gain some weight during the process of trying to figure out, you want to be an artist? Okay, here you go, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, as far as the stones go, I think the beautiful thing about that situation for me is that when I first came into that situation, it was a whole new world as far as just the types of fans. It was they're, they're different than Luther's fans. You know, it's a different I'll sort say. Of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like I to me, I look into the audience and I would see what I would see in church. The energy, the people, how folks would dress. You know, folks coming to a Luther concert, they dress a certain way. You know, it was just like, it, there's a, a warmth and, um, and it felt familiar to me. Um, the women flashing boobs and the pot smoking and the whatever else is going on in the audience thing with the Stones things was a little different. <laughs> Um, but it was <laughs> through, the, I have two brothers, and so a lot of times I, I'm, I feel like I'm lucky enough to see things through the eyes of my brothers. And so it helps balance me out, because a lot of times, even though I'm their sister, um, I sort of felt like one of the boys, you know? and. So a lot of their, you know, rough humor and stuff like that, I could turn that around and see what I needed to do to make that not be, you know. And so looking at the audience through the guys on stage, for them it was entertainment. You know, it's like, oh, did you see that girl over there? So I'm just like, okay. <laughs> 
And so it, you know, after years of that, it's like now I'm just like, I'm good, I'm good. I can look at it and be like, this is their choice, this is their opportunity to be a part of the show, to give them something to remember, whether it's good or bad. It's a yearning to wish to be seen and a wish to be heard. And when I look at most audiences, I think that's something that's universal. How people do it is individual. That's an individual choice. And you know, people should have the freedom to do what they want to do. I don't see myself doing that kind of thing. That's not something I would enjoy, but for some people that's freedom. That's, you know, it's what they enjoy doing. And it's interesting watching these audiences now grow up because you don't get that as much now. You know, it's like now folks are kind of like, they're just happy they're able to stand and hang out and <laughs> share it with their kids and their grandkids, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's this evolution and it's and just been And you're part of that evolution, that sense of, of I can be who I am and be in this world. Mm. Because I think often we, we feel that we have to become something else. Mm. Um, and I think when, when we talk about feminism and the black female body, part of the gift of feminism for me in my life as a, as a teen was that through the vehicle of feminist thinking, I can be who I want to be and I can be accepting of who I am um, even if there's a whole world out there that doesn't share that sense of, of what is possible for me. Yeah, I think they're not nice about it too. I mean, you know, we, we get to that age or that time in life where you say, I don't give a shit, and then half the world looks at you like, what are you talking about, you know? Uh, I think there's, there's a lot of pushback to that, of women being able to just be who they want to be um, or not be a part of this big conglomerate thing, I guess, mm -hmm. called, uh, you know, women and always being sexually available, always being beautiful out there and ready for whatever it is you, you have to, to tell us or show us or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's almost a backlash in some ways of, of us just being who we want to be. Um, so, it, it, you know, it was interesting that you were talking about um, growing up and, and seeing all these influences. For me, um, I remember prior to the 90s, I grew up with images of black women that were somewhat positive, and though there was a lot of negative, certainly television has added to that negativity. But I remember as a kid going to museums, that was, for me, that was so stark. And, and, and seeing these wonderful exhibits, and, and I remember always thinking, didn't they ever paint black women? Yeah, I would be waiting, you know, going to all the museums looking, looking for that one dark person, you know. Uh, and sometimes I'd find it, most of the time I didn't. And I kept thinking, but wait, I knew they existed, you know. I knew we were in England. You guys were, you know, colonialist. I know you brought some of us back. Uh, somebody painted us somewhere. Um, then, you know, I discovered Gauguin and all of, all of his stuff, you know. They weren't really black girls, but they were brown. I'll take that, you know. Um, and I had to really search and find. But um, I, I say all that because, you know, I'm writing this play now, or it's actually done, but it's called In a Roundabout Way. And it's about... Mary Todd Lincoln and Elizabeth Keckley. You saw the movie Lincoln and, and Mary Todd's seamstress who was by her side. And what I found fascinating about this relationship, especially about Keckley, was she's really the first woman who had to sort of deal with this whole thing that you write about all the time, self-actualization. You know, slavery ended, and here she is, a successful seamstress who worked in the White House and she's free, and now she's got to figure out what does that mean? 
you know, for us to figure out what self-actualization is, is kind of easy in a sense. You know, we have all this negative stuff, all these images, all this shit that's at us, banging at us every, every day on television and magazines everywhere telling us we're less than, we're fat, we're no, no good or whatever. And some of it is good. But imagine her, you know, and I think about her all the time. I think, God, you know, five minutes ago she was a slave and now she's free. And she's got money, so she can just go off and be the free woman she is, but not really. Imagine all that baggage of slavery, and she had abuse, and she had all this horrible stuff that we talk about, you know, either through personal experience or generational. But she had it happen to her, like, right there. So how does she do it? And I always think of her, and I think if she did it, then Christ, certainly we can do it, you know? Um, the mind is such a powerful thing. You know, as, as, a, as an actress who, who ha, has done countless TV commercials, that, that was my career in the 90s, you know. I saw all kinds of crap to you guys. I'm so sorry. Um, we're paying for it now. Uh, oh, but, I like those paper towels you sold me, Kim. <laughs> Thank you, honey. But you know, you know, we often ask ourselves, you know, or we often say, you know, violence is violence in t TV and in movies. That doesn't really influence us. That that stuff is just movies. We all understand that. And I think, wow, you know, look at a TV commercial, 30 seconds, and I know what it takes to to make these things right. My first commercial was Red Lobster. I remember being in a room with a lobster, a whole bunch of lobsters. <laughs> and there was a guy whose job it was to paint all the lobsters red. And they were like, ksh, ksh, squeezing them with water, ksh, ksh, painting them. There was a lady in charge of making sure the claws were perfect. And I, mean, and I was standing there like, uh, lipstick, me, you know? They're like, no, this is about the lobster. And, and it's true. And for 30 seconds, they tell you how delicious and wonderful this thing is, and they make millions. 30 seconds of me going, hmm, and you run out and you buy it. So how come we don't think that that same thing in a one hour TV series in which every night there's a woman All lying right. dead All and right. blood splattering, or every night, and, and Sharon and I talk about this, and Karen. We pay, <laughs> Karen Chilton, another actress in the audience, friend of mine, you know, we're all these, these actors who play the role of the, the black mama whose son has been killed. And we, we, we keep threatening we're gonna get the scripts and put them all side by side, because they're all the same thing. It's like, he's dead? <gasps> my son, my son, my son! You know, and the cop says, I'm sorry, Mrs. Brown, but your son? <laughs> He's dead. <laughs> no! So you don't think that that influences society, the violence, the, the you know, the negativity constantly? You know, if I were a white woman, I would be standing at the doors of the network saying, wait a minute, every night I'm dead on, on the floor, usually in some scantily clad outfit covered in blood. Enough already. Enough. Um, and so when you see the negative stuff, and I don't mean all of it, you know, I'm not saying it should be banned. God knows, I wanna work. I'll, I'll play the mama whose son's dead if I have to. But th there's so much more in our lives, so many great stories where no one's dead okay. or murdered or dying. <laughs> Um, but I think that's what, when Shala told the story, for those of you who weren't there yesterday, Shala Lynch, the filmmaker of, of Free Angela Davis and other political prisoners, when she told the story about her four-year-old girl having, struggling with her self-concept uh, and with enjoying her natural poofy hair and how um, when she finally finishes the Angela Davis film that she's worked on for eight years, and her little girl is looking at cuts from the film, um, and she looks at a loop over and over again where uh, she likes it when, when Angela is saying it's genocide, 
Um, and that was her favorite phrase. But what was fascinating is that as she looked at this more and more, she started to change her attitude about her hair. Um, and she finally, you know, one morning her mom is saying, well, what are we going to do with your hair? And she was like, I've got Angela Davis hair. You know, we don't, we don't really have to do anything with it. And I think about Carrie May's uh, section that you'll see if you go to the Guggenheim Afro Chic. And the whole, but the whole idea of transforming the mind um, and how the mind can be transformed by an image, which is why media, has, visual media, has so much more power than written. Absolutely. And you know what's fascinating is it's not hard to do. It's real easy. I mean, something like scandal, right, can change overnight a young girl's idea of who she is and what she is. Now, whether or not you like it or not, or Carrie Washington or not, you know, I think she's a little too conservative. I like to dress her in something other than black and white. Um, <laughs> she's always wearing black or always wearing white. Um, Watch yourself, Kim. I love her. Trust no, me. I, I, I mean that. What do I always wear? <laughs> Miss Hooks, I worship at your throne. You know that. <laughs> you can wear whatever you want. But um, it, it's not hard to change uh, an image uh, to use it. I mean, it's why they make commercials one year saying, you know, buy this sandwich because it's tasty. And the next year they'll say, buy the next sandwich. It's tastier. Mm -hmm you know, new and improved, and we buy it. It's so much, e it's so easy to change our thoughts and minds around how we feel about ourselves and how, you know. But that's I why I was, I think Lisa's image was, I mean, Lisa's image, I always, you know, as a cultural critic, when I see something that fascinates me as Miss Fisher did, I wanted to talk to other people about how did you see that image? What did it make you feel? And when I, I, I talked to so many people who talked about seeing her evolve into this body in which she is comfortable, in which she is powerful, uh, in which she exudes a, a, a kind of enjoyment and bliss in her work, um, was really transformative. And when you think of us as, as older black women especially, when do we see that? I mean, think about. The, the predominant image of an older black woman in film and movies is the mama maid. Um, well, it's, it's, changing. it's changing a little bit. I mean, Viola Davis is now doing a, a show. Um, what's the name of that show, Karen? She's doing a show now where she's playing a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And she's all cute and sexy. I have a friend who's doing the production design on that. And he says, Kim, every outfit is gorgeous, and she's looking fierce. Now, she was the one in the maids. Right? The help. Oh, the help. Oh. The maids. <laughs> Don't tell her I said that. But the help, yeah. And so there, you know, there's that. And, and the woman who played with her, who won the Oscar, whose name I forget. <laughs> Middle age amnesia. But uh, it used to be that, I think. And it's getting less and less of that. I you hope know. you're right, Kim. I, well, I see those as little moments. There are moments. Are I mean, you I was in. Back yes, in? Here. Yeah, I, was, I was just thinking, it, it's, it's always, to me, this finding this balance. It's like trying to see all the pages of the book so you can get the full story of what's there mm -hmm. as far as mm -hmm. who we are. You know? and, and we're, we're, we're her too, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I don't have a problem with showing a big, round, beautiful black woman. Mm -hmm. What I have a problem is showing a big, round, beautiful black woman who's, you know, uh, they want to stereotype into this, she got an attitude and she's real mean and nasty. It's like, how many times do we have to see her? Mm -hmm. I know her. She's, a, yeah, she's out there, but mm -hmm. that's not the only person out there, okay? Mm -hmm. So we can show the different versions of us. Mm -hmm. um, and it used to be when I started early on, and I won't tell you the year because I'll have to kill you, um, <laughs> where it was only one of us. You know, it'd be one black woman and that was her. And mm. she was working. Mm. And you watched her and you waited till she died and then maybe it would be your turn. <laughs> you know? So now we have more. And it's kind of nice to turn on the TV and go, oh, look at her. And look, she's different. Oh, she's different. 
Mm. But it's funny, I find that the years that I don't turn on the TV, which have been quite some time, <laughs> um, I feel like I grew stronger within myself. Mm. Um, I mean, I used to be like a total fashion magazine person. I, I love to look at all the fashion magazines, but then I began to notice myself and others that we would feel a certain depression. That's true. After looking at those magazines and not only just not seeing images like yourself, because when I see a Lupita or an Iman, I don't feel like I'm seeing somebody like myself. Um, I mean, in terms of, of just being a regular person in the world, uh, coming to terms with your looks and, and who you are, I, I feel like not consuming so much of those images made by others, not in my interests, um, really helped me to grow stronger in self-love and self-esteem. I have I, to tell you though, Bella, I know white women who don't like those magazines because they oh, don't yeah, portray white women. No, I know you're not trying, but I'm just saying those magazines are, are evil. But I'm, but I'm saying also that, that there is a counter hegemonic power in mm -hmm. when you don't have those things, what do you make? That's true. What, what are the images that speak to you? And how much do you celebrate those images? I mean, I just was talking to Gloria Steinem uh, a few minutes ago because she, you know, celebrated her 80th birthday and she told me, you know, that she was going to South Africa to ride the elephants, that that was her, her, her a thing she'd done in her past that was very pleasurable. And I was like, well, okay, honey, send me a picture <laughs> of you and the elephants because I want to post that uh, on my desk, near my desk where I work. But that's a different kind of image that here, here is this 80-year-old woman who is deciding what brings her joy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, she was, she was like, Belle, you could have gone, but I was like, I'm in Kentucky and I won't even get on a horse. Don't even think that I'm gonna go to South Africa and get on an elephant. That's not gonna be me. But I want to be inspired by seeing you on that elephant and knowing that you, at 80 years old, move towards um, a memory, a recreation of a time when you felt strength and joy. And I think it's, it's those kinds of images that I see myself accountable to making for the young women and men I teach, um, that to, to be, um, to embody the self-love, the self-actualization, not simply to talk about it, but to have it embodied in one's behavior, one's actions. Um, when I was talking to somebody about choosing, wanting to talk with Lisa, they said, oh, that's not real. She's just, you know, that's just an act. Um, and I was thinking about the whole world of what it means to be a black female and to be constructed more often than not in public representations as harsh, as mean, um, as, you know, I go about as bell hooks, people will say, Oh, I, I didn't. I just didn't expect you to be the way that you are. And I was like, "What do you mean? Like I'm a putty cat, but mm. you didn't expect me to be that. Um, you expected me to be this fierce, kind of ugly person. I mean, it's back to Carrie Mae Weems saying that the images she saw were just so ugly. But I was thinking about well, how sad it is that we're so traumatized and distorted that we can't even appreciate." the positive image, the, 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 the positive energy. I mean, these two women are in my life because they exude a certain kind of positive force in their being and in what they do. And I, I've been thinking so much over the past years that if I could give black American folk anything, it would be that sense of being positive, being, being able to receive joy because I think it's, it's there in that place of joy that we have a certain kind of strength. And to me, joy is connected to feminist thinking and practice. It is the vehicle um, that affirms for me every day that I have that right to be exactly who I am, where I am, creating that work that is such a source of strength and power to me 
and hopefully to others. Well, you know, it's, I was saying to you earlier, and it's true, it's in Sisters of the Yam where, where you talk always about that. And for me, that's always been uh, a, a mainstay in my life and constant in my life and helps me get through those moments where I need that positive juice to, to overcome uh, bullshit that's being thrown at me. For instance, um, and I'm sure this has happened to you, uh, you know, you're in an audition, and I was just in an audition recently, and I, I did whatever I had to do, and the guy, the director says, can you do that more sassy? And so we, you know, you've heard this a million times, and I looked at him, and I just started laughing. I just, <laughs> sassy? Uh, he says, yeah, you know, she's tough, and she's, you know, make her, you know, more sassy. Be that bitch that you are, black <laughs> woman. Bring it out, bring it on. And whenever they do that, I always just say, okay, got it. And then I do it exactly the way I did it before. <laughs> and then you see them go, yeah. Because they can't quite say what they want to say, which is be a black lady, a mean black lady, or a, have an attitude, or be ghetto, or do urban. That's my new one. Urban, you're, you're urban. <laughs> urban, you know. So yeah, that's a stereotype. And we've moved, actually, we're kind of lucky. We moved from, you know, mammy to ho. To ho. <laughs> <laughs> ho will always be there. Ho will never die. <laughs> we're in a sexualized world. Ho will be around for a long time for all women. We must fight that. Uh, and then, and so now it's the, the ghetto urban slash is sort of kind of dying a little bit. It's still on life support, but it's, it's there, you know, ghetto, ghetto, urban lady. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking about what you were just saying about uh, the sassy thing. And there's a, yeah. <laughs> there was a scene um, in the movie, uh, 20 Feet from Stardom, that we were recording and uh, Joe Laurie, one of the singers, is, uh, she just finished uh, doing her song and interview. And uh, so it's my turn to go in. And I'd been working on this piece, a Samuel Barber piece. It's a choral piece. And it was just something about the melody was magical to me. I wanted to know exactly what the sopranos were singing, what the altos were singing, what the tenor was singing, and I wanted to know how they intertwined, and I wanted to know where it was going, and when it got big, and when it got small, and why, and what were the words, and just, just I was in it, I was in it. And so I was, you know, going online and, and listening to different core groups doing it, but people on YouTube doing it. I wanted professionals and non-professionals, I wanted to hear what the melody did uh, for people who were considered professional and people who were considered non-professionals, and it was the magic of this melody. And so we're in the studio, and Morgan comes up to me. Now Morgan is just the bomb. He's the bomb. Uh, he's open, he loves music, he's, uh, he's joyous, and he wants to get each person's spirit but we hadn't really spent any musical time together, you know? And so he says, you know, you know, I need, um, you know, do you, do you know any like Aretha Franklin songs? And, I want to know that too. Yeah. <laughs> I want her to break into one. Yeah, right, 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 right. And I said, you know, I do. I said, but I'm not feeling Aretha right today, <laughs> you know? And I, only because I felt that there's only, each, each singer's voice is like a fingerprint. And, and anything else to me is just trying to be like, you know? And I, it, it's, 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 it's sacred. You gotta kinda just let her be her. And, and, and the way that she sings comes from her history oh and who God. she is and yes. who her parents, you know, just everything that is her. And for me to come in and, and just do an Aretha Franklin song, I just felt like, <laughs> you know, this is not gonna work. So I said, so what if we do the Samuel Barber piece? And he's looking at me like, huh? 
<laughs> but he was so cool. I was like, it's this choral piece, and I explained it to him, and he was like, oh, okay, it's got different voice parts, and then all of a sudden the light went on. And he's like, okay, we can film it like this, we can do that, we can do this, but that would not have happened unless I said, I don't, I wasn't feeling like being right. someone else today. It was like I wanted to be the, the planet I was circling around that week, mm -hmm. you know? We talked about that, Bell, right? About who chooses what, when to do what mm -hmm. and, and but, how. And what are the risks? Did you feel there was any risk to you in saying, I don't want to? Yeah, and, you know, the little girl inside is going like, Am I messing up? Is he gonna hate me? Am I, you know, I have no control over the film. I don't know, am I gonna come out looking like an asshole? Is it, you know, blah, blah, blah. all the fears, all the things, you know. And, and the reality is, is that I wasn't looking at him clearly. You know, his passion is to be this mirror that's like a piece of glass to the rest of the world. It's like he sees a reflection and then the reflection is, is like now glass and then the rest of the world can see what he sees. And I was just so accustomed to just doing what people asked me to do because being good at my job is what I like to do. You know, and so all of a sudden when someone asks you as a background singer, you know, what's your job like and how do you feel about it? It's kind of like you, you're happy that you have a job. You're happy when your employers are happy. And if you find some joy in between all that, that's the ultimate. That's the ultimate. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. So tell us a little bit about how the success of the film, has that changing things for you? Yeah. yeah. I didn't know who you were before the, the that's film. That's okay, that's okay. I still don't know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's changing all the time for everybody, but I think the film, the, the most beautiful thing to me about the film really doesn't have so much anything to do with me more than it has to do with people realizing that everyone, anyone that supports someone or something. It's a background singer on some level, you know? It's like you, you don't really want, if you have children, you, you don't want to take their glow. You want them to shine. You want them to, you want to support them in what they're doing and, and your joy is their happiness. And that's, for me, what the background singing world is about. It's like if, if folks are not happy around me, then there's just no point. You know, it's no point. And I think that we all have that. We all have that on some levels, if it's not in our job, hopefully within our families and our friends, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, uh, I would invite you to sing us a little something that you feel like you could sing. Ah! <laughs> and we will open up to questions and answers. Um. I know, right? Let my children know. She would kill me. Oh, God. Um, I have too much respect for her to wreck her song. Um, okay. Free my 
some bell hooks words before I that know. so I could say and Lisa Fisher was my backup singer. <laughs> <laughs> retake, retake, retake. <laughs> Who has a question? Short, sweet. Okay, your name? Not really well. I, uh, say your name again. Melissa was asking about my nose piercing. Yeah, when did that come into the mix? You know, was that a part of your making a decision? Was that like a rite, rite of passage at any point in your evolution as a female, you know? Girl? It was in the sense of doing something to my body. Um, it was, there was this beautiful Indian woman walking down the street in my neighborhood and she walked like she was walking on air. And she had this beautiful nose ring. And I said, when I get big enough, I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. And so a dear friend of mine, uh, back in the day, uh, he was, um, we were rehearsing and his uh, wife had a nose ring, Muslim woman, beautiful woman. And I asked her, I said, would you mind piercing my nose? She said, sure. And at that point, my mother had um, already passed away, so I was, you know, <laughs> figured I was uh, safe to uh, not get an ass whooping. So, um, so she started to pierce my nose with this. Uh, they used to have these self-piercing nose rings, and uh, so I told her where I wanted it, and she put a little ink pen in the spot that. I was going to have it. And then she takes the nose pin and she starts pushing it through. And then she steps back. And I'm like, what's wrong? And she says, it's stuck. And I'm like, well, get it unstuck. I was like freaking out. You know, she put the ice on all that stuff. Finally, she wiggled it and it popped through. And um, I was like, all right. I was lucky it wasn't, you know, like scarred or keloid or anything like that, but um, I nursed it and everything was cool. And I felt like, okay, this is great. And then you go into a work situation and they're like, oh, what are you gonna do if there's a job? And you know, back then people were asking me to take it out of my nose, you know? And I just, I just wouldn't do it. I just wouldn't do it. And uh, my brothers would tease me and they go, yeah, so like when you blow your nose, does it pop out on the other side? <laughs> you know, stuff like that. You get that kind of stuff. But I love my nose ring. I'll have it until the day I die. And just from that story, I will never have one. Yeah. Ever. <laughs> I never. have no tolerance for <laughs> pain. <laughs> yes, your name? Um, my name is Hannah. Um, first, I want to say that um, I love the movie, and I no longer refer to what you do as backup singing, but rather foundation singing, because you guys are the heart and soul of that music. Um, that being said, one of the things that really resonated for me, I'm a performer and an actor as well, and one of the things that really resonated for me in that film um, was the fact that your soul, your art, your voice, and who you were came up at a time where there was the gatekeeper economy of art making. Um, it had to be filtered through that lens that doesn't represent us. And now, with the way that you know, technology is democratizing that process, I was wondering how both of you plan to take control of your voice um, using technology while we still have the window. It's the continuance of just not giving a shit. It really is. I think understanding the difference between what your job and responsibility that you say you're going to do and saying, OK, I'm going to take this on and do that. But again, it's this balancing that I'm always searching for. 
it's trying to figure out my purpose, you know? And trying to make the connection and the balance so that I can be okay doing anything. I should be able to do anything, you know, and everything. Yeah. Well, um, I'm, I'm not a singer, God. I, I'm not a singer. Oh, you see that. Gee, I'm gonna life. hire you for that role. <laughs> <laughs> My next life. But um, as an actor, um, I've taught myself Final Cut Pro. Um, I have a website. Mm. I like what you said about democratizing art. I think that that's the way to go. Every young person I know, I say, teach yourself, or you probably have it in school. I know half the kids, they teach Final Cut in high school. Oh, you're so lucky, you know? Uh, make your movies now. Start making them, learn the camera. I mean, all that stuff is, is the way to go now. Uh, for someone like me, I mean, it's really hard to sit there and try to figure out Final Cut Pro, but I did it. Um, you, you can do it. And so that's the easy part, frighteningly enough, is learning Final Cut. And then now you gotta get a camera and figure out how you're gonna do it. And you gotta write the script which is actually, for me, a blast, you know, writing it, writing the story that nobody else is gonna write. Um, so the democratization of art, to me, is the most exciting thing right now. Uh, it should be out of the hands. I mean, right now we're in the, you know, I, I do a lot of volunteer work for Screen Actors Guild AFTRA, right? I used to be on their board, I'm a trustee on various things, and, and it's so exciting to see and also very distressing at the same time, this sort of media war that's going on. You know, with the internet, is it on the internet? Is it on a computer? Is it on your phone? Is it on TV? Uh, and so we're all sort of living in this crazy world of not sure, sure where it's gonna end up. Who, you know, it's gonna be three people with it, or two maybe, uh, in about 20 years. But until then, we're all stuck with all this insanity about Google Chrome or Time Warner Cable or the 20 other places that we could get. So while that's happening, it's fabulous for us because there's all this content that needs to be put on these sites. And this is your time to enjoy that and use it and write, oh my God. Black women, there's so much stuff now on YouTube and all these other stations that they're creating their own episodes and their own series and their own stuff. You should be doing that if you're an artist any kind of artist, you should have your own show on YouTube, period. Anybody want to start one with me and can work a camera, call me. <laughs> um, and I'm serious, you should do it, write it, shoot it, perform it. Another question? Hi, um, my name is Talani. First thing I wanted to say was, um, in my head, I ran up and down these stairs and shouted in the hallway while you were freeing my soul. Thank you for that. <laughs> it was so good. <laughs> but um, the question that I did have was, um, since the talk was about liberating the black body, how did you all feel about the Leslie Jones situation and how it um, sort of aroused or arised? Remind me of the Leslie I Jones situation? Yeah, yeah, help me. Um, the skit that she did on uh, Saturday Night Live in regards to um, her dating experience and how she compared it to slavery and how she was like sort of the um, the best cream of the crops sort of thing. Oh, she could be the slavery. best breeder. Yeah. yeah, as a breeder, and now in the 20th of oh, the 21st century, she would never get a date anywhere. Yeah, I, I saw. Part seven on, on Huffington Post, and I actually turned it off. You know, I, I don't want to give her a hard time because it's always hard to be the first. You know, I auditioned for Saturday Night Live 20 years ago when I performed for a comedy improvisational company. And I knew then I would, I was, first of all, I wasn't funny enough. I, I don't think I could do all these different characters that they wanted because my characters were all based on black folks and black history. I mean, isn't that what comedy is? It's a collective idea of what we all find funny from things we know well, right? And so because we live in a 
capitalist patriarchal. What is it that I'll say? I always get it wrong. Imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. Hello. Because that's what we live in. That's what all comedy is based on, right? It's based on what's funny mostly to them. So when I go in, or when I did go in, and I did my kind of humor, you know, fell on deaf ears. And so here she is trying to make it in that world and trying to make something funny, not just for capitalist, imperialist, <laughs> patriarchy audience, but she's looking to try to make some connection with black folks and anybody else. And she's gonna stumble and she's gonna say, say stupid shit, which that was, uh, some of it was stupid shit. Um, but you know, I, I can't give her a hard time because she's the first, you know, and so she's, she's trying to find her way. And part of it is her trying to please the capitalist patriarchal <laughs> the, that is that side and keep her job. And the other part of her is trying to, trying to make something funny. I like the woman on Daily Show. She rocks it. What's her name? She's terrific. And, and even though a lot of her stuff is written by the capitalist paper, <laughs> you know, whatever, the, a lot of it is written by her too. And she really kind of gets in there and finds the, the intelligence and the, the interesting stuff that we all find funny. You know, uh, that poor girl on SNL, when I heard about her and saw her at first, I thought, oh my goodness, honey, good luck. Uh, and I know she's gonna stumble and fall this is nothing. Wait, I'm sure it's going to get worse. <laughs> you know, it may get worse before it gets better, but I wish her all the best. But I find it interesting as someone who has been so brilliantly critical of 12 Years a Slave that that is me, Bell Hooks. <laughs> People have really been hostile to me for making a critique of the film. And yet, here is this comedian who just says her, you know, off the wall joke or what have you, mm -hmm. and people pounce on it. Yeah. And let's face it, that comedian's words will not have any of the long range impact of the film 12 Years a Slave. Um, and the, the thing about, as I pointed out consistently, no black female in that film has a voice. No black female in that film is represented as in resistance. Um, and for me, that film does not hold my interest. I am not fascinated by images of the black female body raped, tortured, what have you. I'm not fascinated by made up sex scenes, um, like the one you know where the woman crawls into to whatever with Solomon, and you think, where does she come from? Oh, the slave ship one. Uh, is that when the slave no, ship, when they're no, on the, the slave and they're in the cabin? Yes. But it's like you think, oh, right, right. Pardon why me. is this happening? What yeah, is this that was about? Bizarre. And I that thought was it was bizarre. such a reproduction of the 19th century notion of black women as sexually licentious. Yeah, and even when I, she's a slave and yeah. in chains, she's she needs it. Her, yeah, she's, she's got to get, get it. Groove on. Stella may have to go to Jamaica. It's like of all the things she could think of that she needed, right? <laughs> Stella, <laughs> she, could be, she could be in slavery and get her groove on. I mean, and think about that. If we're not going to be silly about that, think about <laughs> to what extent that undercuts what Patsy is suffering. Absolutely, I agree because with that. Because it normalizes the idea of the black woman as having this you know, hot sexuality that has to express itself without boundaries. Yeah. Um, because remember that there are people around uh, when she's expressing herself. Yeah. And so that there's that whole, whole way in which the film both uses Patsy. I've urged all of audiences to imagine that film without Patsy because it's the whole sadomasochistic sexuality, the whole, even the tension between Solomon and her body and his relation to her body. And let's face it, Solomon, when he gets his freedom, you know, goes on his way. <laughs> um, and so that, the, that whole construction of black femaleness um, is it, right in line with all the, 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 the negative dehumanizing images of black females that we are bombarded with daily. Yeah. But I want to go back to that point. 
that people don't jump on that the way they're jumping on the comedian. And that when I try to just encourage critical discourse about the film, people want to tell me, well, you know, it's, it's such a great film for, for these reasons. And I mean, I'm, I'm always pondering this since I wrote the piece on Beasts of the Southern Wild. Oh, I hate about that the movie. Little girl. I and, hate that and movie. I got more hate mail with people saying, you know, I couldn't see the beauty of the film, the, the fact that I was saying that, you know, when I see a little black girl eating cat food and being slapped across the room by her alcoholic father, I don't happen to find that sexy and charming. No. You know, but, but again, one of the things feminism brought to the fore is the whole question of standpoint. I mean, I can't tell you what's going on behind me because I can't see it. And I think that increasingly I, I'm trying to have good Buddhist compassion for people who can't seem to see uh, what I see or, you know, like, or what's there, let's say, like with 12 years a, a slave, that they can't seem to see how the filmmaker exploits the body of Patsy in as much as slavery also exploited the body of black females because she carries the certain kind of, I mean, the ingredients of films in our culture and documentaries especially, um, what is the rhythm that carries the film? What is, the, what is it that conjures up um, certain kinds of feelings and thoughts? And it's her body that's used to conjure up so much else. And then I pointed out at our session on black girls how frequently the camera would move from the sexualization of a grown black woman to a little girl. Like, you're next, honey. Beast of the Southern Wild, get in line. Your little body is next. And so I think that that's interesting in terms of what do we police? And how easy is it for people to police this young black woman? And how much harder to police the film that's winning the awards that people are saying is so wonderful. Uh, that is hard to take, especially with Beasts of the Southern Wild. When people were calling it the most beautiful, wonderful film, it made me insane. Um, but getting back to, to 12 Years a Slave, I was, we had this conversation at lunch where I said, well, I, I, didn't, I liked it because I liked a lot of it. I mean, you are absolutely right about those points that you make, which I think were, were absolutely correct, especially the, the woman wanting sex in, in the thing. That was stupid. But um, I thought 12 Years a Slave was the first film that I ever saw that showed, to some extent, what slavery did to white people. And that's hard, I think, for people to take because you saw what it did to that slave owner. You saw what it did to his wife. You saw what it did to their relationship. It brought to life, for me, what Martin Luther King always talked about, about racism being hard on the person you're being racist to, but equally hard on the person who is racist, you know, that whole thing. And, and so for Hollywood to show that, was for me a milestone. Because usually it's, you know, oh, you know, look what it's done to the black people. Let's, and nobody wants to see it because it's uncomfortable. I have friends say to me, I, you know, I was going to see 12 years, but I can't. It's, I heard it's just terribly violent and awful, and I really can't see it. And I said, do you watch Law and Order? Because, I mean, that's violent, OK? This is not hard to watch. It's hard to watch because you watch that, and you take it upon yourself. And I say, you need to know that it's hard for me to watch too. It's hard for me to watch Patsy get beat like that and for black people to be treated that way and to know that that's my heritage and that's where my family, a lot of my family went through in northern Louisiana and plantation country. That shit is hard to watch. So if it's hard for you, you know, join the club. And so let's be hard together and watch it and talk about it. Um, so, Anyway, I got off on a rant, sorry. Well, yeah, because I was going to say to you that I'm not interested in any film that illuminates anything about men or white people at my expense. And I don't care how deep and profound the illumination is. Because the question becomes, I mean, sometimes I have all these fantasies that we could take something and remake it and re redo it. Like, like, what if we didn't have the fantasy sex scene in the film, but we had the wife saying something about what those 12 years had been like for her? Mm -hmm. Or 
um, if we had Solomon thinking back in any way about his relationship to Patsy and um, you know, just how, how one could tweak it um, in ways, because I think that people, people want so much to see things as um, this is how it is. Or like people said to me, well, you know, there was no voice of the black woman in the book. And I was like, yeah, there was no sex scene like that in the book either. Hello. So let's, let's be able to bring that crit critique to bear mm -hmm. on what we choose to put out there. Yeah, agreed. What we choose to make possible. And in, it, it's the same way I think a lot about incest. Because on one hand, feminist politics brought to the fore um, the, the widespread abuse of children and girl children, especially in our society. But then it became a kind of trope, an entertainment trope. Like if you read mysteries, you know, all of a sudden in every mystery, the killer was, you know, tortured by his mother. And, and so that, that very recognition of something that we thought would lead people to feel more like we must resist this, we must fight against it, it actually became more out front with itself and like more of it than less of it. And that was a real hard thing for me to see because I think in social justice movements so often we think the issue is awareness. If people became more aware of this, mm -hmm. um, and we see it with domestic violence, we see it with the traffic in girls and women that in fact Awareness in and of itself doesn't necessarily lead to action. God, no. And That's very true. Is there, there's another question floating out there. There are questions over here. You have a question. Yes. Can you reach this? Uh, hi, Femi. Um, hi, it's my friend, Femi. The film Pariah. Um, yeah. The film Pariah. Yes, your daughter, the young girl who played your daughter, <laughs> uh, that character. Yeah. Can we talk about that a little bit? My tiny little character. I played her mother. Did everybody hear that? Okay. She was saying that my, my daughter in the film was kind of going after a self-actualization, trying to discover who she is. Um, I almost think that she did know who she was, but, um, and she, she kept exploring that at the expense of, of everybody else. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, I play this cool mother who sort of let my daughter be what she's gonna be, right? Sure, have your friends over, let them spend the night, no big deal, play have music, whatever. Have it's sex okay. with them, it's all right. I didn't actually say that, but it's kind of cool. I, I kind of like think it's cool. My daughter was her lover. Yes. Yeah, who said. She wasn't having a problem with identity. No. Ah, so you're asking about the other one? That character. Ah. Who was trying to find herself. Yeah. Oh, so what do I think of her? Yeah, and, and how it was portrayed in the film. You know, it's kind of like... Um... Well, you know what? Uh, when I first saw the film, there's that wonderful opening where she's on the bus and she's saying goodbye to her friend and then there's no words as she takes off her hat and puts on her little pink shirt and becomes the girl that she wants her mother to be. And I thought, wow, every woman can relate to that. I remember going to school, and my mother would put me in these long skirts that were plaided, uh, plaids, right? She, my mother had some idea that I was Irish. <laughs> Where did she get that from? Like we were in Ireland, you know, or something. I mean, these plaid skirts with penny loafers, and she'd put the pennies in the penny loafers. I love you, Mommy. I miss you. Um, but um, uh, I would walk to school, and on the way to school, I would roll up the skirt to make it a mini skirt, because nobody was wearing long plaided goddamn skirts, and so I would roll it up and make a little plaid mini skirt, and I'd take the damn pennies out of there and throw the pennies away and take off the socks at least, you know. Uh, but everybody, not everybody, but certain, certainly I did. I wanted to, to know who I, you know, I wanted to be me. And there's that, I think that's all of us. It's, that's why I think that movie was so successful in many ways, because it was universal in that. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter that she was uh, gay, but then going home to be straight. I mean, it did matter, but that, I think it said more than that. It was saying, 
and that's why Pariah was so successful. It wasn't just to me about a girl being gay and trying to be gay in a black community, though that's important. To me, it was a girl saying, this is who I am, okay? And, and can I be who I wanna be? Whether, you know, who cares what it is, but it's me and I'm choosing that. And she goes through the whole movie fighting that and, and insisting on it and getting it in the end. And everyone, I mean, I've had old white guys say to me, you know what, I almost left the theater. And then halfway through, I, I started getting it. And then at the end, they love it. Because it is, it's a universal story. Um, yes. I had a, um, Your name? Jeffrey McCune, sorry. Um, Jeffrey McCune. I, I am very honored to be here and have appreciated this conversation on many levels. Um, and, and a few minutes ago, I was, I was kind of sitting on the edge of my seat um, because part of what I have understood is very powerful and I was very really interested in this idea of liberatory power, um, that that happens through reading, right? Our reading practices. And I think that sometimes, I, I guess my question is that it seems that we are largely focused on the production of images, right? This idea of what is produced. But I think that even for 12 Years a Slave, even for the SNL skit, right? The reason why we're able to see something more there than just something to be dismissed might be because our reading practices are shifting and that we're able to actually find these moments of liberatory potential, even if it's minuscule or kernel. And I think that the, in a conglomeration, those kernels become something that, it, that could be potentially radical, that kind of stir us up in this room or get me on the edge of my seat. And so I wanted you to talk about, and Lisa, you really brought this to the, to the fore, um, just the way in which you, know, you began to kind of read yourself differently, right? Not by Luther's gaze, but actually through your own gaze, right, and, and in dialogue with some other things. So how can we talk about maybe the reading practices? Do you mean literal reading or personal inner reading? I think both. I, I, not literal like reading books, but I mean like, like mm. really like how we're interpreting, right, the world in which we live and our relationship to it. I'm hoping I understand the question properly because but I think, I feel like the time that we're in now, where things are quick and things move so quickly and, and, and it's like people will send me things to look at or to read and I feel like I don't have the time to, to dig in and to do things. It's like, it's easy if someone just quickly tells me what their opinion about something is or someone else says, oh, here's a soundbite about whatever. During, the time that I was making music and just making a life for myself, things were slower. And I think you had more time to be in a hotel room with a book, with yourself, with what happened during the course of that day. Um, it's like, now I feel like I'm always trying to catch up and I have to shut the world out so that I can hear my own voice speaking to me. Um, I think now is the time to even guard that you time to hear your own voice more so than ever because you're assaulted by so much. Um, and as difficult as it was to sort of just sort myself out and figure out what am I doing, why am I doing this, where is the joy in what I'm doing. Um, now mind you, it's, there was a lot of joy mixed up in the images. You know, it felt good to feel, to play to reimagine yourself. Um, but I also realized that there was, a, it, it's like an alternate world. And, and I, at the end of the day, I still had to be okay with me and I was fine being okay with me when I'm alone. It's, it's, it's 
other people and what they expect of you, you know? Um, that was the part I found the most difficult. Um, and I was really impressionable. And I think at this age now, one of the, the beauties of being this age is really just being at peace with myself, you know, and just, um, you know, people would say, oh, you're so nice and the blah, 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 and that's just gotta be such bullshit. I mean, you gotta, there's gotta be a bitch living in you somewhere, you know? Um, and there are parts of me that get angry and parts of me that um, have a bad day, you know, and just part of being human. But I feel more comfortable being balanced than I ever have. I don't think I'm there yet, but I, I think I'm, I'm getting there. There's a question there. Your name? How you doing? Um, Hi. My name is Eve, like Eve, -E, not Eve St. Laurent, but you know, like Adam's wife, Eve. Um, what I was gonna ask was, um, do you feel that it is possible for I'm a little nervous, so you know, no judgment. It's okay. um, do you feel it is possible for black women to, um, independently of uh, patriar you know, the patriarchal dominated media and black males, able to create their own um, images that are, that are larger than, I guess, the un unidimensional um, image that's you know, dominantly portrayed in media? Because ultimately, you know, I, I forget if it was Ms. Fisher or Ms. Hooks that said, um, you know, the media has, is far more impressionable to the mind than literacy is, to a large degree, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's, it's kind of, it's more, it's more pervasive and it's more all around us than books are. So how can black women, I guess, what I'm really trying to ask is how can black women uh, aspire to, let's say, something beyond the unidimensional that they've been narrowed down to you know, Dr. Dyson likes to say women's are, women are more than their hips and thighs. They have souls and body, souls and hearts and spirits. You know, that's the way he talks. And um, ultimately, I mean, the Olivia Pope and the, uh, the Claire Huxtable, for example, and are, are kind of the few and far between in a sense, if that makes any sense. So, you know, would, would we as black men have a role in playing that as in, in the, the boosting of the image of, of black women. Did I, did I ask that right? Or? Yeah, I, I think I got you. You're, you're asking where can we get these images, black women, you know, when, when the media and the, the on-camera images are so powerful, where can we get those things? It's where we always have gotten them from, books. God bless books. Mm -hmm. And black women have been writing books since Phyllis Wheatley wrote the first one. And, or actually, it wasn't her. It was somebody else before. She was the first poet. Who was the first, who wrote the first book? Carrie E. Say it again, sweetie. Harriet Wilson. Yeah, Carrie E. Wilson. And so we have, oh my God, you know, that whole collection of Schomburg, uh, of women writers, black women writers, uh, that was put out by Gates, Louis B. Louis Gates. It, 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 there's such an array of, of uh, works. I mean, I, I will always remember when I first read Ain't I a Woman. That for me is change, was one of those moments that changed my life. It's how Bella and I became friends. Uh, my husband at the time uh, was really good friends with Walter Mosley and we were having dinner one night and Walter was going on like he does. You didn't hear that from me. And, uh, <laughs> and he says, well, my friend is Bell Hooks. And I went, what? And I made him call her up and, and remember that, do you remember that day? And I went to her house and oh my God, I mean, we've been friends ever since. So, you know, we are so lucky, black women. We have, oh my God, so many wonderful writers out there who pour out their souls for us and talk about the same things we talk about today. 
you know, they were talking about it in 1864, and uh, and they have all this great knowledge. I mean, that's that's the frustration I think sometimes for artists and for a lot of us when we talk about how art is based on our history. When we try to do art and nobody knows the history, you know, we try to create this great stuff, and they go, "What the hell are you talking about?" And you go, "Wait a minute, don't you know?" And they don't. You know, that whole saying of you can't go for it unless you know what was back there. It's true. It really is true, especially for an artist, because all art is created from history. All of it has something to do with that, unless it's modern art. <laughs> <laughs> I like modern art sometimes. OK, we have two questions down here. Or you like this up there? Go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Brian. Um, I have a question about um, the the vali validity of mistakes made in films like Twelve Years a Slave, where these false portrayals are given. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak to how important it is that these mistakes are made to have a, a, a concrete example for how these mistakes are made in attempt to remedy the absence of an important message. Um, and, and if you see uh, some salvation in the film despite the, the mistakes. You know, you can say that about any film, right? The problem with us is that we don't get 50 films a year, so we don't get to say 12 Years of Slate was terrible. But did you see, you know, so when one comes out, is everybody jumps on it and we're all like, wait a minute! and we pick it apart and we slice it apart, rightfully so, uh, even if there were 150 movies. But, you know, it's difficult for us uh, to, to take someone's artistic view, and then I'm gonna get on the other side of the camera, someone's artistic view and said, you know, you should have done this and done that. Um, you hope the director and the producers are enlightened folk that would actually take the time. I mean, you remember the Academy Awards and the writer for 12 Years a Slave won and they showed the director and he was like this. And people were like, oh my God, there's something going on. And for weeks, people talked about there must have been something between the writer and the director. They were fighting and blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, in the back channels, the word was that the writer uh, wanted to, or, or the writer, let me get it right. The writer wanted to write the book. And he wrote the book. And there was nothing he veered away from. But the director wanted to veer away a little bit. And that's where I think that sex scene came in from, sorry, Bell. I think that's where that came from, the director, because um, it's not in the book. But, but, you know, then we get into that crazy place where we decide, you know, how do you tell the director how to do his work? And how do you get in between his creative vision and whatever? And his creative vision is twisted, as we know most of Hollywood's creative vision is when it comes to women and minorities. So just because he's black doesn't mean he's any different. Um, so it's, it's a tricky thing about correcting stuff. You just hope that younger folks like yourself who know the history and who take the time to ask questions will then do a better film. The next 12 Years a Slave, whatever that's going to be, will hopefully be better than that. Um, you know, I can't imagine that he shot that sex scene and there was no one on the set powerful enough to go, what the hell's that? What, what are you doing? And I have a feeling that that was probably a big fight between the writer and the director. That's a guess of mine. Your name? Good afternoon. My name is Mai Perkins, and I've been very inspired and encouraged by this talk and, you know, both of your career, all of your careers, actually. Um, my question is for you, Ms. Hooks. Um, you said that awareness in and of itself doesn't lead to action, and, you know, I took that to mean so action related to social justice and or female liberation, and so would you just mind, it was a really quick statement that you said, but um, some of the work I'm doing right now has to do with the perception of awareness and social justice action anyway. So I'm selfishly asking, <laughs> you know, if you can just speak a little bit more about what you were um, talking about. Well, I about. think that we are, we, 
we, for, just like, for example, with racism, we used to think that if people were really informed, there would be this natural movement away from racism because people would understand, like, at no point in our nation's history are people made more aware that race is a social construct than right now. And I will say one of the cinematic um, and television things that has brought that home is transplantation. That is to say that I know that I could get a heart from a white person in South Africa and it could be put into my body um, and allow me to extend my life, a kidney, all of these different things that, that on a certain level of awareness deconstruct the notion of racial difference. Um, and yet, people can watch those TV shows, they can see this happening, and they can still believe that black people are fundamentally different from other groups of people. So that we still invest in notions of a certain kind of race identity, even when all the information around us is constantly challenging that notion. That's what I mean that awareness in and of itself doesn't bring change. That people have to have an action, that you have to have an action step. Um, Brene Brown in her book, Daring Greatly, says, you know, her getting the yoga mat and buying the yoga clothes and, and reading all the yoga books means nothing, finally, if she doesn't take the actual action to do yoga. Um, That's why I hate online petitions. Don't hate them. I think they're very important. But I think a lot of people sign their name, and then they go, ha, I did something. I don't know where that came no. from, Kim. <laughs> it's about an action. <laughs> <laughs> we are, uh, we, there was a question. Behind, yes, your question, sweetheart, your um, name? Hi, my name is Caitlin. Um, I had a question in um, kind of a selfish question. Um, how do you deal first um, with the rejection that comes with um, show business and the, the singing and acting world? And also, what suggestions do you have for getting more gigs in New York City in the singing world? <laughs> if there are I'm so any. Sorry. <laughs> I always see always the. Uh, when people ask you about gigs, sorry. When people no, it's ask true. It's the, yeah. the, especially the, the re, well, how to get them, you mean? Yeah. yeah, well, you get them just by doing the work. That's, yeah. there's no other way to do it's it. It's hard. You, yeah. you know, you can get it other ways, but we, I think you know what those other ways are. I don't have to tell you. But really, it is about doing the work and being ready for when the time comes. Because if you're lucky, the time will come. Most people, the time will come at some point. You just got to be ready. And so, do the work. Whether it's to do it at home by yourself or in a class or to pursue it some way, the best way. Right now I'm doing tons of Shakespeare. Oh my God, I'm so good in my living room and, <laughs> and in my acting class and with my friends. So when the time comes, I'm gonna be ready, right? And that's, that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. As far as rejection's concerned, um, boy, that's, that's, you know, when you're young and rejection, you think I'm just gonna do it, I'll I didn't get this one, I'll do the next one. You know, and you can do that for a couple of years. And then there's that point where you get, and it's part of the I don't give a shit moment, where you think, oh, wait a minute. God damn it, I know I was good. What the hell's wrong with you? And when you get to that point, you have to step back and go, okay, Kim. Mm -hmm. Step back and just, again, it becomes about doing the work and just concentrating on the work. Yeah. So when the rejection well, comes, the you know it's not because of me, but it's because I'm just, they're not, it's not, I'm not right. I mean, the work is what you have. It's the only thing you have. Power with. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, those first few years when I wrote those Bell Hooks books and there was no money involved and there was no um, fan or star, anything involved, it was about that passion with the work, uh, the passion with ideas mm -hmm. um, that would keep me going and, and moving and writing. And then when you get to that other stuff, it's just icing on the cake, but the cake always is and has to be the work itself. We are coming to a close. Is there a last question here? Oh. Hi. Siggy. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Siggy Tefessa, and I go to the New School for Drama, and I'm studying directing. And um, I, uh, 
Okay, I hope this comes out correctly. Or anyways. Um, my question is around, um, with, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested in like, what is it, like liberatory image making, whatever. Um, making images, right, of, of, um, of myself and people that I, that I see in my life that I think are, anyway, should be out there. Um, and I guess my concern is around like, I like, I like makeup, right? Like, I like dressing up and going out and feeling pretty. Um, and I also, like, I consider myself a, you know, I'm a sexual person and, and I'm happy about this. And um, I think you need celibacy for a few years. <laughs> no! <laughs> no. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's an option. But my, my, my question is, like, how, um, how to go forward with image making and also just as myself as a person when, like, there is all of this, there is this, we're, we are indoctrinated with this culture and this idea of what black sexuality looks like and what black female bodies has looked like. And, and yeah, I'm saying a lot of words, but I just wanna, yep, that's it. You know, there's a lot about, not just for black sexuality, but all of us, the sexualized world we live in, right? It's been normalized that we think of sex all the time, that it's, uh, that it should always be there, that you should have it whenever you want. I mean, every night we see the Viagra commercials, but no one talks about the fact that there's tons of old ladies in Florida who are getting AIDS in their 70s, right? We don't talk about consequences of having what you want all the time, any time. So, you know, uh, getting back to your your question, yeah, you can do all that and, and makeup is great and sexuality is wonderful and, and Belle jokes about celibacy, but I think she's right. I think there are times in your life where you just don't want to have sex. It's normal. I said that to my doctor actually a while back. I said, you know, my sex drive's not what it used to be anyway, Kim. That's how it goes. That's how life is. That's how it used to be until Viagra. Now it's like Viagra and you can have sex <laughs> whenever you want, 24 hours a day with an erection that lasts four hours. Mm. It's like if someone came to me with an erection that lasted four hours, <laughs> I would be, get that thing away from me. <laughs> well, <laughs> Go take I, a nap. I, I mean, like really, to, so. Us to close by thinking about <laughs> accountability in relationship to what you create so that it isn't what I think it isn't whether something is good or bad, but it's your accountability in relation to it. Um, I, I think about a shirt that I saw that I really, really loved, and it had the image of an Asian female on it and writing, but I didn't know what the writing said, and I really had to interrogate myself around, why do you want to wear this Asian woman on, on, uh, on your body? and where are these words that you don't know what those words say? Because I think one of the things that happens in liberal individualism is we're made to feel like, okay, do what you want um, if it's not hurting anybody. But the question of accountability, um, you know, how, how many Asian women writers am I reading? How many Asian women am I getting to know? Why would I want to wear this Asian woman on my shirt if I have no relation to Asian, the diversities of Asian cultures. And so I think that is the kind of question we have to ask ourselves in terms of production and the types of images we produce is what is our intentionality and what are we willing to be accountable for? You know that Beyonce and um, Sheryl Sandberg in, in conjunction with Girl Scouts um, have had this movement called Band Bossy um, and uh, because Cheryl was traumatized by being told she was bossy as a child, um, and they're, they're basically trying to say that's very negating of girls. Well, I'm sitting around being flip um, with Twitter, and I say, be bossy, change the world. And so then it set up this kind of, you know, unnecessary conflict tension. But I wasn't thinking about my intentionalities or whatever. I was just being flip. Mm -hmm. um, and my notions at times of being witty um, or what have you. So that I think, again, to recognize that you are accountable and to think about the impact of an image or anything that you produce beyond yourself. 
not just whether I like it, and to get past like or not like, uh, and to think about impact and consequences. Um, I think those are, are, are more relevant. So as we close, I do want to give a shout out to Stephanie Browner, who has helped to make this possible by her support, and Heather, her executive assistant, who has to deal with all our longings, all our complaints, and the fulfillment of our desires. So we thank you again for coming.